Section 18 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adam Marzatich, July 2010. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 18. Josephine, Part 1. A truer, nobler, trustier heart, more loving or more loyal, never beat within a human breast. Baron. The island of Martinique claims the distinction of being the birthplace of Josephine, who was born the 24th day of June, 1768. Her father, Monsieur de Tascher, was a man of influence and moderate wealth, possessing a large plantation and an ample retinue of slaves. He was a man of ambition and unyielding sternness, and to this, in a great measure, was owing the misfortunes which embittered Josephine's early life and threw her into the whirl of events that bore her on to greatness and suffering. Her childhood was spent in lively sports and amusements, attended by young negresses who were permitted to indulge her every whim, and accustomed to obey instantly the most childish requirements, till, by unlimited indulgence, her naturally sweet disposition was in danger of being spoiled. Fortunately, Madame de Tascher was wise enough to see this, and brought Josephine more within her maternal influence, allowing her a larger share of the affection which had been almost exclusively bestowed upon the elder, more beautiful, and only sister, Maria. The latter, like her mother, was of sedentary habits and a mild, unimpassioned temperament. Thus, they had more sympathies in common, while Josephine was all vivacity and enthusiasm. She was a favorite with her father, and from him came all the instruction she received, till, on reaching her twelfth year, she was placed under the superintendence of Maria's teacher, who gave her lessons in the form of amusements. Her sociability and excessive fondness for dancing led Madame de Tascher often to give fetes at which the young creoles of the island were assembled. But the somber Maria rarely participated in these festivities, much preferring to pursue her studies or to ramble alone. She was busily occupied in cultivating such talents as she possessed and acquiring those accomplishments deemed necessary to a woman of the world in anticipation of a future home in France where an aunt, in influential circumstances, had offered to provide her with an establishment, and designed her hand for the son of the Marquis de Beauharnois. Josephine, on the contrary, looked upon the island of Martinique as her continued home, when she gazed over the ocean that separated her from the rest of the world. It created no longings to mingle in the dissipation and reckless folly that her mother described to her as pervading la belle France, but the sight inspired in her a strong love of grandeur and sublimity, and increased her already lively imagination. But there was a spell that bound her heart to Martinique, which gave her contentment in its quiet retreats, or otherwise her active, restless spirit must have sought a wider world. Through all her childhood, Josephine had shared her amusements with William de K., the son of English parents, who had sought refuge in Martinique after the fall of the House of Stuart, whose cause they espoused, and therefore suffered prosecution. The two children had grown up together in happy companionship, and formed an attachment that was never effaced. When Josephine reached her twelfth year, she had made so little progress in her studies, though an apt scholar, that Madame de Tascher decided to send her to France and place her in a convent till the completion of her education. 
but this was a terrible stroke to the young lovers, to whom separation would have been the greatest grief. By the most earnest assurances from Josephine of her future application, she was permitted to remain on trial. During the following six months, she made such rapid progress as persuaded her mother to recall her threat of sending her from Martinique, and she not only allowed her to continue her studies with William de K. under the same master, but through the interposition of his mother, Josephine's hand was promised him conditionally. Thus they happily and lovingly remained together, studying or rambling for shells along the seashore, carving their united names upon the trees, or gathering the beautiful blossoms of the amaryllis gigantea, a plant which she so admired for its associations as well as its beauty, that she afterwards planted to the garden of Malmaison, where it still grows luxuriantly. Not long after M. de K was called to England and was accompanied by his son, with the avowed purpose of pursuing his studies at Oxford, but unknown to himself or Josephine, the real object of the voyage was to assert heirship to an estate which M. de K. was to inherit on condition his son should marry the niece of the testator. The months of silence that ensued were so full of anxiety on Josephine's part that her health was evidently suffering from it. No letter nor message came from the young Creole, who had seemingly forgotten her in the new interests of the great world, yet she would not believe the representations of her friends that he had ceased to love her. To console and divert her, Madame de Tascher gathered young companions in their pleasant home, and endeavored to occupy her mind by an interest in the study of languages and accomplishing herself upon the harp. She possessed a sweet, plaintive voice, and that kind of talent which readily acquires anything placed within its reach with little application. She chiefly enjoyed quiet walks with Mademoiselle de K when they would lounge together under the shade of romantic cedars talking for hours of William, or throw stones at tree marks, to ascertain by the stroke if her lover was faithless. But this friendship was of short duration, for Mademoiselle de K. deceived her. Josephine's true, transparent nature had affinity only with candor and simplicity, and she could no longer endure her artful friend. While the Pagery mansion was gay with the young Creole girls, gathered to amuse Josephine, a new excitement one day aroused them from a languid siesta and inspired them with all the vivacity which so especially belongs to the French, the fortune-telling fame of an old Irish woman, or, as some have it, a negress, called Euphemia, who lived in a sequestered and wild retreat called the Three Islets, reached their ready ear. Curious to lift the veil of futurity, they one and all decided to consult the oracle. Josephine accompanied her companions more for their pleasure than her own, not wanting to believe what might be predicted, but with a secret thought of William, she followed the gay party, who, with laughter and harmless sallies at each other's expense, hastened to the dark, rocky glen, where the fortune-teller's hut was half-hidden among a wild growth of large-leaved plants and tall trees. Their courage began to fail, however, as they approached the dwelling, but, after some whispering hesitation as to who should dare to enter first, they summoned boldness enough to make their errand known. The old woman sat upon a cane mat in the center of the cabin, and, perceiving the shrinking girls, called on them to come nearer. Each successively submitted her hand for inspection, and to all were predicted extraordinary adventures and misfortunes. 
Josephine presented hers last, though she would have gone away unenlightened but for the persuasions of her companions. The lines of her hand being attentively examined, she was told, You will soon be married, but not to the one you love. The union will not be happy. Your husband will perish tragically. You will then marry a man who will astonish the world, and you will become an eminent woman as a superior dignity. The young girls returned to Madame de Tascher, half frightened, half unbelieving at the strange destinies predicted. But Josephine made light of the whole affair, entirely unwilling to have faith in a prophecy which, if fulfilled, must separate her from William de K. Not long after, the sudden death of Maria, who was in the midst of preparations for a voyage to France, cast a deep gloom over the family, which had hitherto known only joy and gaiety. The mother could not be consoled at the loss of her favorite daughter and companion. Touched by her mother's grief, Josephine determined to imitate her sister so closely as in a manner to fill the sad vacancy, which, with her sensibility, she felt most poignantly herself. At once the child became a woman. Her amusements, her reckless rambles, her gay companions were all rejected, and she remained at her mother's side or employed her hours in the most studious application to pursuits hitherto neglected. Her efforts and rapid progress surprised and attracted Madame de Tascher, and henceforth the amiable Josephine felt herself fully repaid for her exertions in receiving the unlimited affection and approbation of both her parents. At this time, the arrival of a package from France and the proposals it contained afflicted her with a new and serious anxiety. The wishes of her aunt to receive her in Maria's place and also to bestow her hand where her sisters had been promised, were quickly made known to her by her father. "'You promised me to William de K replied she, in surprise at her father's tone of assent to the arrangement. But he assured her that was no barrier, as William was obliged to marry a joint heir of the estate fallen to him, or forfeit the bequeathment, which his father would not permit. Besides, said he, William has forgotten you. You should cease to think of one who has so neglected you. Knowing nothing of the affectionate and overflowing letters which her parents retained from her, she was persuaded to consent to what her father would allow no refusal of, and after many tears, regrets, and useless entreaties, she separated from her family her quiet home with all its happy associations, and left the wild and romantic island of Martinique for a home in a land where she was to reach a position and acquire a fame, exceeding the wildest dreams of ambition her father could have entertained for her. As the ship, which was to convey her to France, left port, a singular phenomenon attracted the attention of all on board, as well as those assembled on shore. A phosphoric flame, known to mariners as St. Elmo's Fire, attached itself to the masthead of the vessel, throwing out jets of light and encircling the ship with crown-like rays. Those who had heard the prediction in respect to Josephine looked upon it with superstitious awe, but she was too much overcome with grief to regard it in any light and remained unconsoled during the whole voyage. To a young girl, scarcely fifteen, it was a severe trial to be separated, perhaps forever, from her family, and more especially from the affectionate sympathy of an amiable, cultivated, judicious mother. She was kindly received at Marseilles by her aunt, Madame Renaudin, with whom she repaired directly to Fontainebleau. During the ensuing month, 
Josephine could not overcome the depression of spirits, fast infringing upon her health, and not lessened by her knowledge of the presence of William de K. in Paris, his frequent attempts to see her, and the discovery of his unchanged affections. To see him would but add to their distress, since he was betrothed to another, and the negotiations for her own marriage were in progress, while, on the other hand, the young Viscount Beauharnot was extremely repugnant to the match. Though he had admired the picture of Maria, he was extremely disappointed in Josephine, and at the same time was entirely devoted to a Madame de V, who possessed his affections. Josephine, bewildered and ill, but still dutiful to the commands of her parents, permitted her aunt and the Marquis de Beauharnot to use their influence with the Viscount, but she entreated permission to retire to a convent on the plea of her ill health. The Abbey de Panthemont was selected by Madame Renaudine. Josephine remained there nearly a year, and, at the expiration of that time, became the wife of Alexander de Beauharnot. He is described as an amiable, accomplished man, of noble and dignified bearing, and a favorite at court, where he obtained the sobriquet of the Beau Dancer from his graceful participation in the festivities of Versailles. He highly esteemed Josephine, but his unabated attachment for Madame de V, together with the scandal continually poured into the ears of his wife, gave rise to such jealousy on her part as to destroy their domestic peace. The birth of her son, Eugene, for a time diverted her, but, through the maliciousness of her rival, Beauharnot, in his turn, became jealous of her early love, Annoyed by her tears and reproaches, he left her, on the plea of business, to remain several months at Versailles. Josephine then withdrew entirely from the gaiety in which her new possession had thrown her. Though her debut at court had been a flattering one, and the favors shown her by Marie Antoinette were sufficient to give eclat to her present, Yet she gladly escaped from the vortex of pleasure in which the giddy French were continually involved, and retired to a quiet retreat at Croce, where she resumed her long-neglected studies, successfully cultivating the talents that, now fully awakened, gave a more decided tone to her character. She was grieved at the neglect of her husband, but she was greatly consoled in her trials by the birth of Hortense, the more welcome since she was deprived of the society and care of her idolized son, whom his father had placed at a private boarding house. Hearing from Madame Renaudin of Beauharnot's intentions to obtain a divorce, she retired to the convent which had before received her determined to remain till the suit was decided. Confident of her own innocence, and sincerely attached to the man, who was strangely blinded to her faithful affection through the misrepresentations of spies upon her movements, and overwhelmed with grief at the turmoil in which her sensitive heart was continually plunged, she shut herself within the gloomy walls of the Abbe de Pontemont, submissively enduring, and performing the innumerable penances imposed upon her by the abbess. Hortense was her companion in this grim, somber prison-house, lessening the tediousness of the long melancholy hours. Two weary years dragged away thus, serving at least to obliterate every trace of frivolity that might have remained from her light-hearted girlhood and giving that dignity and composure to her manner which are the impress of long-continued grief. It also enabled her to cultivate, though unconsciously, 
a fortitude of character valuable in her after trials and so chastened her spirit as to inspire her with ready sympathy in the afflictions of others a trait that endeared her to the french nation when she wielded the power of an empress and one which she could not have possessed to so keen a degree but for her own early trials as soon as the parliament at paris had decided the suit of divorce in her favor she determined to return to martinique but unable to prevail upon beauharnois to allow eugene to accompany her she was obliged to embark alone with hortense two years of quiet home life in her native island somewhat restored the natural cheerfulness of her temper yet the remembrance of her husband and son widely separated from her often disturbed the otherwise complete rest under her father's roof another interview with euphemia the fortune teller confirmed the superstitious belief she entertained in the destiny that awaited her it was with both fear and joy therefore that she again left martinique for the scenes which henceforth tended towards the accomplishment of her elevation the news of beauharnois acknowledgment of his wife's innocence and the readiness to receive her again reawakened all her affection and had induced her to seek the shores of france and reunite the divided family they met at paris hortense who already gave promise of much beauty, was presented to her father in the free, graceful dress of a young creole. He was surprised to find himself possessed of so lovely a daughter, while Josephine rejoiced equally in meeting with Eugene, from whom she had so long been separated. Several months of peaceful reconciliation succeeded, and Josephine was at last happy. Beauharnois had at this time attained the rank of major of a regiment of infantry. He was also a representative in the National Assembly, and, in the following year, 1791, was appointed president of that body. Josephine listened with deep interest to the political discussions now carried on in her saloons, which were the resort of the most prominent members of the assembly, but she could not conceal her anxiety as to the future of France, and the fate of those who, she foresaw, were to take the lead in the rapidly approaching struggle. Beauharnois preserved a mild, firm bearing throughout the storm that soon burst with frightful havoc upon the nation, remaining loyal to his king, whom he venerated and loved, while he saw and urged the necessity of the monarch's compliance with the demands of the people. At the flight of the king, he displayed a firmness and calmness that challenged even the admiration of his enemies. He loudly declaimed against the execution of the monarch. In 1793, he was appointed general-in-chief of the Army of the Rhine. He was accompanied during that short campaign by Eugene, then scarcely twelve years old, and who had already exhibited military capacity of a high order. In consequence of political difficulties and the withdrawal of the most efficient men from the army, General Beauharnois sent in his resignation and, on his return to France, was ordered to retire twenty leagues from the frontiers. He remained in quiet seclusion during a short period until he fell under suspicion, was arrested, brought to Paris, and, like the host who already crowded the prisons, awaited in chains a speedy death. End of section 18「
Recording by Adam Marzitich, July 2010. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 19. Josephine Part 2. Madame Beauharnois was filled with terror at the news of the long-dreaded catastrophe. She exerted all her influence and eloquence to save him. She, too, was imprisoned in the gloomy walls of a monastery belonging to the Carmelite priests, the other prisons being already crowded. Hortense was kindly cared for by a friend of Josephine, and Eugene was adopted by a poor artisan, with whom he labored, employing his leisure hours in study and military exercises. Madame Beauharnot was not alone in her imprisonment. Her room, and the adjoining ones, were occupied by ladies of rank, who, like herself, suffered innocently and waited in hourly expectation of being led forth to execution. In the midst of all this terror and grief, Madame Beauharnot, preserved a calm, fearless aspect, in part supported by her belief in the prediction of her strange future. To inspire her terrified companions with courage, she assured them it had been foretold she was to be Queen of France, and if the prophecy was to be fulfilled, they should surely escape death. Thus she consoled and amused her trembling companions, while, at every entrance of the harsh, unfeeling jailer, they were nearly paralyzed with fear, lest their turn had come to be conducted to the guillotine. To their own perilous condition was added a distressing anxiety for the fate of relatives. They managed to obtain journals, in which were lists of the executed, but no one had courage to glance over those pages of crime or could read with unfaltering voice the names of friends numbered among the victims of the bloody Rospiere. One morning, as Josephine read the list, she came to the name of her own husband. A cry of agony announced to the pale group about her what her lips could not articulate, and she fell senseless to the floor. Surrounded by companions to whom her kindness and gentleness had endeared her, she received every attention in their power to bestow, yet was restored with great difficulty. Repeated fainting fits succeeded the shock, and the ensuing illness delayed her execution. A few days afterwards, a friend found means to allay the intense anxiety of the remaining prisoners by adroitly thrusting a slip of paper through the grating of the window. It contained the cheering words, Ruse Perry and his accomplices are marked for accusation. Be quiet, you are saved. What a relief to the long-continued fears of the exhausted prisoners. And when, on the following day, the great iron doors were thrown back for their free egress, with what joy they left behind the grating locks, the barred windows, the cheerless cells, and breathed a pure, free air again. Then came the thought of beloved and dear faces they were to see no more, the remembrance of the family circle broken, scattered, and bleeding under the iron tread of a mad tyranny. They could not seek even the fireside, doubly dear for the sake of the lost. Without home or shelter, they could only depend upon the bounty of those who had escaped such an accumulation of calamities. With nothing left of all her estates, her relations equally deprived of their wealth and unable to assist her, Josephine was nearly reduced to a state of indigence and depended upon her own exertions and those of her young son Eugene for support. To him she read and reread the treasured letter Beauharnot had penned just before his execution, full of touching affection, regret for the doubts he had ever entertained of his wife's love, anxiety for her and the fate of their children, and overflowing with tenderness towards them all. This last gift, these words of remembrance, 
were dwelt upon with tears by mother and son, while they fired Eugene with the wrongs of France, and made him impatient for the arm and voice of manhood. Straightened in their means, Josephine applied to Tallien, and succeeded, after a time, in obtaining a small indemnity from the public property, which enabled them to live comfortably with economy. She educated her children by the exercise of her own abundant talents. The only amusement in which she indulged was a daily visit to the saloons of her friend, Madame Fontenoy, where were assembled those who, like herself, suffered from the events of the Revolution, and had not even their titles remaining. Thus, Madame Beauharnois passed a long time in seclusion till, through Tallien's exertions, a compensation for her sequestered estates were given her, by which means she perfected Eugene's education, he being placed under the discipline of General Hoche, with whom he acquired the military skill for which he was afterwards distinguished. Napoleon Bonaparte was now the rising star of France. He was received in society as a distinguished guest, notwithstanding his lack of noble blood. He commanded notice by his unquestionable talent, energy, and ambition, as well as by his exciting wit and his eccentricities. He had heard much of Madame Beauharnois through a friend, entitled in her secret memoirs, Madame Chat, Wren, whose soirees he frequented. He was also interested in her as the mother of Eugene, who attracted his particular commendation by the bold, manly freedom with which he had presented himself and demanded the privilege of wearing his father's sword. Josephine and Napoleon met one day, just after the daring Corsican's feats, with the Parisian division of troops, newly placed under his command. The meeting was at the house of their mutual friend, and of this occasion, she says, While sitting by a window, I was looking at some violets, of which my friend took the greatest care, when suddenly the famous Bonaparte was announced. Why, I was unable to tell, but that name made me tremble. A violent shudder seized me on seeing him approach. I dared, however, to catch the attention of the man who had achieved so easy a victory over the Parisians. The rest of the company looked at him in silence. I was the first to speak to him. It seems to me, citizen general, said I, that it is only with great regret that you have spread consternation through the capital. Should you reflect a moment upon the frightful service you have performed, you would shudder at its consequences. Tis quite possible, madame, said he, the military are but automata, they know nothing but to obey. The most of my guns were charged only with powder. I only aimed to give the Parisians a small lesson. Tis, besides, my seal that I have set upon France. The calm tone, the imperturbable sang-froid, with which Bonaparte recounted the massacre of so many of the unhappy citizens of Paris, roused my indignation. These light skirmishes, said he, are but the first corsications of my glory. Ah, said I, if you are to acquire glory at such a price, I would much rather count you among the victims. Madame Beauharnois conceived the greatest dislike for Napoleon at this interview, which was not lessened during succeeding visits. She considered him a vain, ambitious boaster, nor was she at all attracted by his personal appearance. Pale, slender, and short, she donned him the title of Little Bonaparte, and made sport of his eccentricities to his friends. Her dislike for him increased so much that she finally discontinued her visits to Madame Chat 
wrens, to avoid him. But, as she expresses it, the more she sought to avoid him, the more he multiplied himself in her way. Barras, one of the directors, strongly urged her to accept Napoleon, predicting his future greatness, and informing her of his intended appointment by the directory as general-in-chief of the army to Italy. It was some time, however, before she could give her consent to the proposals, or become interested in the singular man who professed the strongest attachment for her. When she finally promised her hand, she concealed the fact from all her friends, dreading their reproaches. Upon her marriage, which occurred March ninth, 1796, two days before Bonaparte set out upon his campaign to Italy, all Paris was in commotion at the unexpected event, and more especially her friends, from whom she had kept the secret. Josephine is described in this, her twenty-eighth year, as by no means beautiful, but her manners and deportment were particularly graceful. There was a peculiar charm in her smile and sweetness, in her tones. She also dressed with an infinite degree of taste. She remained in Paris, at Bonaparte's luxurious hotel in Rue Chanterine, where she was constantly surrounded by the most distinguished persons of Paris, assembled to do homage to the interesting wife of the general who was creating such a lively sensation throughout France. During the three following months, nothing was talked of among the Parisians but the brilliant victories of the young general, who was striking terror in all Europe by his skillful strokes and unheard-of success. He had already penetrated into the very heart of Italy. Couriers were daily dispatched to Josephine, keeping her fully informed of all his movements. The victory of Milan achieved, the Austrians were conquered, and the Italians paid homage to the daring commander. He won their admiration while he subdued them. Nothing was needed to complete his satisfaction but the presence of his wife to share his honors. In his frequent letters, he entreated her to come, readily obeying his slightest wish. She left Hortense in charge of Madame Campan to complete her education and proceeded by rapid stages to Italy, the land of sapphire skies, towering mountains, and hills luxuriant with fragrant vineyards, and rich in palaces and cathedrals, abounding in magnificent cities, and enlivened with a population in gay and picturesque costumes. These scenes enchanted Josephine, who was animated with a glowing appreciation of the beautiful and sublime. Napoleon gave her a cordial and enthusiastic reception. The Milanese were full of curiosity and eagerness to behold the wife of the wonderful warrior to their excited imaginations. He seemed the god of war personified, or at least possessed of some wonderful talisman by which armies were made to vanish at his pleasure. All the distinguished and the elite of Milan paid court to Madame Bonaparte, who captivated them at once by her irresistible sweetness and affability. If they had honored Napoleon before, their ardor and worship was redoubled at the additional charm with which the musical and love name of Josephine invested him. Balls, fetes, and concerts succeeded one another in the bewildering profusion of magnificence, and the princess of Italian states, were outdone in the display and state of Madame Bonaparte's court. The expense occasioned by this outlay, together with her generous gifts, caused some reproof from Napoleon, but he was silenced by her adroit reasoning. In some sort, said she, your wife ought to eclipse the courts of the sovereigns who are at war with the French Republic. 
Napoleon continued his conquests, forcing his way even to the midst of Rome, and humbling the Pope in his own high and hitherto invulnerable place, while Josephine remained at Milan, conquering the hearts of the people, and keeping them in complete submission by her prompt and efficient measures, munificent gifts, conciliating kindness, and flowing sympathy. It was here in Italy that Napoleon learned the rare traits of his wife. He plainly saw she was to be henceforth indispensable to his advancement, security, and glory. Here she first acquired the strong influence over him that ceased only in her death. With the satisfaction of rendering her position safe, by keeping him informed of the secret jealousies and intentions of the directory in france by a clear unerring judgment gaining a clear voice in his diplomatic measures as well as martial movements by her address securing an unbounded influence over the admiring italians with nothing to fear and everything to hope josephine was seeing her happiest days she was sipping from the golden cup of fame and splendor, but like all the rest who partake of its enticing draughts, she found bitter dregs underneath the sparkle and foam. After the campaign signalized by Wormser's decisive defeat, Napoleon returned to triumph to Milan, where Madame Bonaparte had remained, and celebrated there the anniversary of the Republic with the utmost pomp and costly luxury. The round of pleasure quickly wearied the hero, who delighted most in the sounds and excitement of the battlefield, to which he eagerly returned. The constant display and stately ceremony that Josephine was obliged to keep up during his absence was fatiguing and distasteful to her. But, once freed from this restraint, she breathed with intense delight the perfumed air of the enchanting country around Milan. Upon one occasion, she visited with Napoleon the singular and beautiful islands of Lake Maggiore, from which rose luxurious villas, surrounded by terraced gardens, where the citron, myrtle, and fragrant orange trees perpetually blossomed and hung heavy with tempting fruit. These lay in the midst of the lake, and clear, glassy waters rippled here and there before the swift prows of winged boats, plying to and from the Switzer's shores. Beyond, toward the Alps, the eye falling first upon vine-covered slopes, wandered farther over wooded heights, then above and beyond, to where white and gray rocks, boldly outlined, shot up in snowy peaks, lost in a veil of blue mist that shaded into crimson when the rays of the evening sun had left the valley to linger in warmest colors upon the unclimbed heights. The beautiful city of Venice, too, called forth her enthusiastic ecomiums, its massive palaces, costly churches, and wondrous bridges everywhere spanning the streets of water, through which only noiseless gondolas continually plied. Its delicious gardens decorated with innumerable statues, vases, fountains, and the gay, musical people, in endless varieties of dress, everywhere lending a lively aspect, together gave an air of storied romance that threw the French women of Josephine's suite in ecstasies of delight. The Venetians greeted the wife of the victor with flattering honors, while she, with her characteristic generosity, lavished gifts and kindnesses upon them that riveted their extravagant adoration. By her thoughtful intervention, the rigors and devastation of war were in a measure checked. Cities were spared pillage, the vanquished treated magnanimously, and the helpless protected, acts which exalted and endeared her to the Italians far more than her gifts, 
and secured the devotion of her husband, half jealous by her evident power. I conquer provinces, Josephine conquers hearts, was his playful comment. Suspicions of the directory, and knowing their wish and intention to dispose, in some way, of a man whose growing power and ambition they had reason to fear, Napoleon suddenly and promptly returned to Paris, leaving Josephine at Milan. She was not suffered to remain long. Even the most virtuously great do not escape malice and calumny. Knowing this, Josephine could hardly have expected to have been spared the groundless scandal which was cunningly whispered into the ears of the impetuous, exacting, and jealous hero. Napoleon commanded her immediate return, which she obeyed without delay. He received her with unkindness, and, for a time, their domestic harmony was interrupted. By the interposition of a friend, a reconciliation was effected. The hotel in Rue Chancerine was now too humble for the famed and laurel-crowned victor. In order to maintain a household more in keeping with his position, Josephine purchased Malmaison, an elegant country seat in Byron's of Paris. Napoleon's restless ambition would not allow him luxurious repose, neither did the timid directory wish the presence of so dangerous a man. The French regarded him as their deliverer, and were already fascinated with the name around which clusters so much glory and so much odium. Fearful of the results, the directory gladly acquiesced to the proposed expedition to Egypt, which they hoped might give some pretext in the end for aspersions and dishonor if he did not fall in the contest. This he wisely foresaw, and left Josephine to guard his interests at home, and use her unlimited influence to keep his star in the ascendancy. Malmaison was her home during the year of the Syrian campaign. Without ostentation, she remained in this beautiful retreat, adorning it with every possible attraction. The gardens and greenhouses were filled with the rarest flowers and exotics, of which she was passionately fond. Rich Etruscan vases and graceful statuary, chiseled by the best masters, ornamented the grounds and imparted an air of taste and expensive refinement that attracted amateurs from every quarter. Josephine's income was large, but she greatly exceeded it in gratifying the love of art and the lavish gifts she bestowed upon every applicant from the founder of expensive but valuable institutions down to the poor, threadbare writing master who claimed the honor of first guiding Napoleon's pen. Her generosity never consulted the length of her purse. End of section 19《ヒストリー》を読むことができます。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 20. Josephine Part 3. A constant correspondence was kept up between herself and her husband. He prized her letters, hastily, tearing them open and reading them with the greatest avidity, even in the midst of battle. During the last months of his absence, however, he neglected to write with his usual punctuality and affection, since he had become violently jealous of his wife through the misrepresentations of those who watched her with envy and malice. Reports of his defeat and even death reached France, but while the truth of it was being discussed he suddenly appeared on the shores of France with his characteristic and startling rapidity of movement. Josephine was at a magnificent levee given by Goyer, the president of the directory. 
When the news of Napoleon's arrival was announced, it was received with a thrill of surprise and joy by the guests who crowded the saloon, while Josephine was almost overcome at the suddenness of the event to which she had impatiently looked forward. Immediately resolving to be among the first to meet him on his way to Paris, and thus remove his unjust suspicions, she left the gay circle, and accompanied by Hortense, set out with the utmost speed. Unfortunately, they passed each other by different routes, which mistake Josephine sought to repair in returning to Paris by the fleetest posts, but too late to meet the arbitrary man, whose tyranny she began to feel. He would not receive her when she reached their city residence, since her absence confirmed his suspicions, nor did he abate his resentment, till by the tearful entreaties of Hortense and Eugene, and the reproaches of her friends, who reminded him of all he might have lost but for her faithful and untiring devotion to his interests in his absence. His temper was finally appeased, and he again welcomed the wife who suffered the most poignant grief from this rude repulse of her tenderest affection. They retired to Malmaison, which at once became the scene of pleasure, of political debates and ambitious schemes. In fine, it was here where Bonaparte perfected his designs upon France. Upon his return he found the government weakened by opposing factions, and Italy, which he had so triumphantly wrested from the Austrians, retaken, with but little resistance from the irresolute directory. Irritated by this, his determination was the more confirmed to be the master of his own destiny, and the arbitrator of the French nation, if not of the whole of Europe. Through Josephine's foresight and alertness in discovering the designs of all parties, he was enabled to foil the directory at the moment his real aims were discovered, striking the final blow the very day on which his arrest was to have been made. He had with skilful address secured the enthusiastic services of the military, and when he appeared before the Council of Five, their cries of outlaw him down with the dictator were hushed by the appearance of the soldiery, who rushed to his rescue and scattered the representatives in utter confusion at the bayonet's point. Napoleon was immediately proclaimed First Consul. This anticipated event had been looked to by Josephine with great interest and anxiety, not from ambitious or selfish motives, but because she seriously judged it to be for the glory and good of France, which, since the downfall of royalty, had known nothing but turmoil, bloodshed, and innumerable conspiracies that threatened to enact again the horrible scenes of the Revolution. The Consul took up his residence at the Palace of Luxembourg. This soon proving too small in its dimensions, he decided to occupy the palace of the Tuileries. This was better suited to his aspirations, as having been the seat of royalty. Yet, to blind the lovers of republicanism and to secure the devotion of all, he styled it the governmental palace and had the pet word republic emblazoned in gold letters upon its front. He took possession of it with great pomp, distinguishing the occasion by military display, fireworks, and general rejoicings among the people. The first soiree given at the Tuileries was attended by all the distinguished and the beauty of Paris, as well as citizens of every class. The crowd was so great that even the private apartments were thrown open to the guests. The first consul entered to receive the congratulations and homage of the citizens, with little ceremony and in plain uniform, distinguished only by the tricolor sash worn with good taste and with his usual policy curiosity and conjecture was at its height as to the style in which Josephine would appear as the wife of the hero of so many battles, the subduer of nations and the guardian of France. A curiosity greatly disappointed, when she entered, unannounced, leaning upon the arm of Talleyrand, then Minister of Foreign Affairs. She was dressed with the utmost simplicity in white, her hair negligently confined by the plain comb, and with no ornament but an unostentatious necklace of pearls. The unassuming dress was the more noticeable from the marked contrast it afforded to the splendidly attired ladies in showy brocades, flashing diamonds, and waving plumes that had been selected with the most fastidious care to grace the occasion. The first expression of surprise gave way to a murmur of admiration, as Josephine gracefully passed through the apartments, saluting her guests with fascinating affability and natural becoming dignity. She was at this time in her thirty-eighth year, but she retained those personal advantages which usually belong only to more youthful years. Her stature was exactly that perfection which is neither too tall for female delicacy nor so diminutive as to detract from dignity. 
Her person was faultlessly symmetrical, and the lightness and elasticity of its action gave an aerial character to her graceful carriage. Her features were small and finely modelled, of a Grecian cast. The habitual expression of her countenance was a placid sweetness. Her eyes were of a deep blue, clear and brilliant, usually lying half concealed under their long, silky eyelashes. The winning tenderness of her mild, subdued glance had a power which could tranquilize Napoleon in his darkest moods. Her hair was glossy chestnut brown, harmonizing delightfully with a clear complexion and a neck of almost dazzling whiteness. Her voice constituted one of the most pleasing attractions and rendered her conversation the most captivating that can easily be conceived. The occurrences which followed Napoleon's seizure of power contributed to his fame and increased the enthusiasm and admiration of the French. He was ready at all times to give redress to those who entered complaints. Recalled men of letters and of science who had been obliged to fly, encouraged the arts, gave new impulse to manufactures, and employment to the industrious poor. Through Josephine's influence he abolished the sanguinary laws that oppressed the numerous exiles, brought back the immigrants, and restored their estates or indemnified their losses, till France became gay, happy, peaceful, and industrious, and forgot in this promising era the terrors and sufferings of the past. The consul accompanied Josephine to Malmaison to remain every Saturday and Sabbath, and on these occasions be indulged in amusements in which he was joined by Louis Bonaparte, Duroc, Josephine, Hortense, and several young ladies of the old nobility who had become impoverished orphans by the misfortunes of the Revolution and whom Josephine had adopted, superintending their education and caring for their welfare with motherly kindness. From these unceremonious recreations they returned to the state and pomp of the Tuileries often with visible of reluctance. Napoleon's tyranny over his household and in little things increased in proportion to his power. Especially towards Josephine and her suite, he exercised a wayward and annoying surveillance that would have been insupportable to any other than his devoted patient wife. Her influence over him was widely known, and in consequence she was thronged with applicants of every description. To some she made promises, to some she granted pensions, and for others she interceded with an eloquence that rarely failed. When Napoleon exhibited the selfish, domineering spirit of crushing every obstacle that intercepted the rays of his own glory, wresting from the generals who had faithfully served him dearly worn laurels to crown his own brow, Josephine unhesitatingly reproached him for want of gratitude and charged him with aiming at kingly power. These frequent altercations opened her eyes to his real designs, and caused an occasional coldness between them. She trembled at the suggestion of his assuming a position some day that might plunge them in as frightful a vortex as that which engulfed the last reigning king with his throne and scepter. In May 1800, Napoleon, with a brilliant army, again set out for Italy. Josephine retired to Malmaison where she remained during his absence, indulging in her predominant passion, the study of botany. She also made a collection of rare animals, many of which were sent to her from distant countries, in remembrance of some kindness she had bestowed. So general was the admiration of her character that orders were given by neighboring sovereigns to allow these gifts to pass unmolested even during the time of war. Napoleon was absent but two months. With incredible speed his army had crossed the Alps, in defiance of danger and death, descended upon the beautiful plains of Italy, and with a few brilliant strokes scattered the astounded Austrians, who believed him quietly reposing upon his laurels at the Tuileries. He returned in triumphal march, heavily laden with testimonials of gratitude from the Italians, and re-entered France. Advancing towards the capital amidst the shouts of gathering crowds, roused to the highest pitch of enthusiasm. His arrival at the Tuileries at midnight was first made known to Josephine by his noisy, rapid strides through her apartments, when he came to arouse her with the account of his triumphant success. These sudden interruptions of her rest were not uncommon, for when at Malmaison she was frequently awakened from deep sleep to accompany him in long walks through the botanical gardens and little forest, or to listen to some new plans which had suddenly shot through his restless brain. Not long after his return from Italy, the marriage of Hortense de Beauharnois with Louis Bonaparte took place with great pomp. This union was not prompted by affection, since Hortense preferred General de Roque. 
an unaccountable attachment, as he was many years her senior, of few attainments, and lacked the qualities which usually attract the admiration and love of a woman. Louis Bonaparte was equally in love with a lady whose name is not transmitted to us. He was pale and slender, with a quiet, somber air, not at all attractive. Yet he possessed many traits that won upon Josephine, and caused her to prefer him for Hortense rather than Duroc. One would suppose that the sufferings of her own early life would have prevented Josephine from influencing her daughter to a mariage de convenance, but her extreme dislike to Duroc and disapproval of his principles was her best excuse. She hoped that a union with the Bonaparte family would heal the difficulties and prevent the frequent jealousies and contentions arising between them. To these considerations Hortense was sacrificed. She stood in the midst of a gay assemblage, a jeweled flower-crowned bride, with a heart oppressed with an unendurable weight of sadness. As to her personal appearance, she was not exactly beautiful, for the conformation of her mouth and her teeth which rather projected took away from the regularity of a countenance otherwise very pleasing in all its sweetness and benignity of expression. Her eyes, like her mother's, were blue, her complexion clear, and her hair of a charming blonde. In stature she did not exceed the middle size, but her person was beautifully formed, and she inherited all her mother's grace of movement. At the close of this year the consulship was bestowed upon Napoleon for life, but this additional evidence of confidence and admiration gave Josephine more anxiety than gratification, for with her keen foresight and knowledge of Napoleon's character she perceived the final result and knew full well that his ambitious strides would soon carry him beyond the shadow of republicanism that remained. His imitation of royalty in occupying a separate suite of apartments in their new residence, in the splendid palace of St. Cloud, gave her still greater cause for anxiety. It lent a seriousness to the vague hints of divorce from Napoleon, who longed to perpetuate his power and name through descendants. Josephine, however, was not of an unhappy temperament, and was willing to close her eyes to future ills. Her influence was still in the ascendant, and with this she consoled herself though she sometimes failed in her generous attempts to rescue those who had fallen under the consul's displeasure. She was intensely interested in the fate of the Duc d'Anguien, whose life she pleaded for with unavailing tears and entreaties. The time arrived when Napoleon's crafty and unscrupulous measures enabled him to walk with powerful tread over the very bodies of his foiled enemies, to the throne which, from the first, had been the goal of his ambition. He seemed to throw a mysterious spell over the French people, managing them like a set of automaton toys, making them bow with a blind ardor before the very scepter that a short time before had been hurled from among them at such a frightful cost. Napoleon and Josephine were crowned emperor and empress at the Church of Notre Dame in the presence of an immense concourse of people. Napoleon appeared in a gorgeous state dress, attended by his marshals and all the dignitaries of France while Josephine was magnificently attired and surrounded by the ladies of her suite. An elegantly decorated platform had been erected at the site of the spacious church. Here, after an imposing performance of mass, Napoleon received the crown from the Pope, placed it upon his head himself, and then rested in a moment upon the brow of Josephine, who knelt before him in tearful agitation. The notes of the Te Deum rolled grandly through the spacious area, then died away in subdued tones, leaving a breathless silence upon the vast multitude. The testament was then presented to the emperor, who pronounced the oath with his ungloved hand resting upon the sacred book. The ceremonies finished, the imperial assemblage retired amidst deafening shouts of Vive l'Empereur! Soon after the coronation, Josephine accompanied Napoleon to Italy to receive the iron crown of ancient Lombardy that had been offered him. This second coronation took place in the magnificent cathedral of Milan. Bonaparte immediately appointed Eugène de Beauharnois viceroy of Italy, and after a triumphant tour returned in state to Paris. Josephine now saw the predictions of her greatness fulfilled, but her happiness and peace decreased in proportion to the unprecedented rise of the man with whose destiny hers was linked. She seldom saw the emperor alone, he being almost always occupied in affairs of state or traveling by post to all parts of the kingdom. She sometimes accompanied him, but the addresses to which she was obliged to reply and the endless code of court ceremonials which Napoleon insisted upon being minutely observed were so innumerable that despite her diligence in studying them she could not retain a fourth part of them in her head, 
a great annoyance to her, notwithstanding she never for a moment lost her self-possession. Her impromptu replies, rendered appropriate by her quick sense of fitness, imparted a sweetness and sincerity to whatever she said or did, and not only saved her from censure or ridicule, but increased the admiration and respect of those about her. It is said, however, that on one occasion, when departing from Rheims, Josephine presented the mayoress with a medallion of malachite, set with diamonds, using the expression, it is the emblem of hope. Some days after, on seeing this absurdity in one of the journals, she could not believe that she had used it, and dispatched a courier instantly to Napoleon, fearing his displeasure above all things. This occasioned the famous order that no journalist should report any speech of the emperor or empress, unless the same previously appeared in the Moniteur. It is also amusingly related that when about to visit one of the Rhenish cities, the ladies who wished to be presented, being in doubt as to the ceremony used on the occasion, applied to one who had already been initiated. Among other instructions she gave the following. You make three curtsies, one on entering the saloon, one in the middle, and a third a few paces farther on, en pirouette, whirling on the point of the toes. Immediately all the ladies of Cologne were practicing from morning till night, twirling away like so many spinning tops or dancing dervishes. Fortunately for themselves, as well as the dignity of the court, they learned from one of the empress's ladies of honor that a gentle inclination was all that was required, and thus were relieved from the misfortune of a misstep, and the empress and her suite were spared what must have excited irrepressible laughter and seriously disturbed the stateliness and equanimity of their imperial majesties. End of section 20. Section 21 of The Heroines of History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Heroines of History by John S. Jenkins. Section 21. Josephine Part Four. During all these excursions, Josephine manifested the utmost kindness and benevolence to everyone who applied to her with a tale of distress. Her sensitive nature never permitted her to turn a deaf ear to misfortune or suffering, nor refuse her generous sympathy to the poor. While partaking of a casual repast, by the way, she was sure to offer a portion of it to the passer-by, however beggarly, often adding bounteous alms. Blessings were invoked upon her head wherever she went, and with just reason, for Josephine was a friend to the friendless, a mother to the orphans, and a benefactress to the unfortunate. For some time after the coronation the emperor and empress remained at St. Cloud. While there, Josephine usually rose at nine o'clock, spent an hour in making a toilette, enjoyed a walk or some other recreation, and breakfasted at eleven o'clock, when she was occasionally joined by the emperor, though he never remained above ten minutes at table, considering it lost time. She afterwards received petitioners, to all of whom she gave ready assistance. Retiring to her own apartments, the remainder of the morning was spent with the ladies of her suite, all of whom were engaged in embroidering, while one of their number read aloud from some entertaining and instructive author. Works of fiction were never permitted to be circulated in the palace, as Napoleon was strictly and severely opposed to that class of literature. He sometimes suddenly appeared in their midst, talking gaily and freely with the ladies of honor, and occasionally joining in a game of cards, but his stay was always short. He was often present when the evening toilet of the empress was in preparation, overturning her boxes in his impatience, tossing about the most costly jewels as if of no value, and frightening her attendants by his irritable criticisms. He did not scruple to destroy an elegant dress if it happened not to strike his fancy, obliging her to assume another, a needless interference inasmuch as she was always apparelled with exquisite taste. He dined with her at six o'clock, in company with their invited guests who learned to appease their appetite before being seated at the lavishly supplied table, from which they were obliged to rise before the tempting viands had been scarcely tasted. The emperor remained but a few moments, and the empress and guests necessarily followed him. Thus the utmost amiability was essential to Josephine, to endure these petty tyrannies with an unruffled mien. An important and happy event called her to Munich at the close of the year. The marriage of Eugene with the princess of Bavaria, was magnificently celebrated there. It gave both the emperor and empress the utmost satisfaction, 
not only for politic reasons, but because their mutual attachment gave promise of domestic peace. All that Josephine had desired was now accomplished. Her fears and anxiety as to the emperor's idea of divorce were forgotten after the birth of a son to Hortense, now Queen of Holland. As the young Napoleon advanced to years of interesting childhood, he so won upon his uncle's affections that Bonaparte determined to make him heir to his immense dominions. Josephine's future peace depended upon his life. As though to mock the hope centered in the young prince, death marked him an early victim. He died in 1807, while Napoleon was engaged in the brilliant campaign of Austerlitz. Upon hearing the tidings, he repeatedly exclaimed, "'To whom shall I leave all this?' The event afflicted Josephine with a double grief. She not only mourned the loss of a favorite, but trembled under the stroke that threatened her own happiness. She knew perfectly well that the powerful conqueror would not hesitate to sacrifice her if she impeded his limitless designs though he loved her with all the devotion of which his selfish nature was capable. Nearly a year passed before Napoleon made known to her his unalterable decision, but that year was full of inexpressible torture to Josephine. A private passage determined by a small door connected their apartments. At this the emperor was accustomed to knock when he desired an interview. These occasions, when the subject of divorce was discussed, became so painful to Josephine that the usual summons caused violent palpitation of the heart, trembling, and faintness. She could scarcely support herself, while hesitating at the door to gather strength and courage for interviews that inflicted almost unendurable anguish. The final decision was made known to her May 30th by Napoleon himself, after ordering the attendants to withdraw. Of this, she says, I watched in the changing expression of his countenance that struggle which was in his soul. At length his features settled into a stern resolve. I saw that my hour was come. His whole frame trembled. He approached, and I felt a shuddering horror come over me. He took my hand, placed it upon his heart, gazed upon me for a moment, then pronounced these fearful words. Josephine, my excellent Josephine, thou knowest if I have loved thee. To thee, to thee alone, do I owe the only moments of happiness which I have enjoyed in this world. Josephine, my destiny overmasters my will. My dearest affections must be silent before the interests of France. Say no more, I had still the strength to reply. I was prepared for this, but the blow is not the less mortal. More I could not utter. I became unconscious of everything, and on returning to my senses found I had been carried to my chamber. From this time to the 16th of December she was obliged to appear at the fetes and public rejoicings incident to the anniversary of the coronation, with a smiling countenance and cheerful demeanor, while beneath it all her heart was breaking. Her decision was not formally announced to the public till the 16th of December when the Council of State was summoned to appear at the Tuileries. Napoleon's family, who secretly exulted at the event, were also gathered at the Grand Saloon. A chair, in front of which stood a table with writing apparatus of gold, was placed in the center of the apartment. At a little distance stood Eugene with compressed lips and his arms folded over a heart swelling with resentment. Josephine entered with her usual grace, pale but calm, leaning on the arm of Hortense, who conducted her to the central chair and stationed herself behind it, weeping bitterly. The Empress sat composedly with her head leaning on her hand, the tears coursing silently down her deathly pale cheek, listening to the reading of the act that was to separate her forever from the man for whom she would have laid down her life. Napoleon, in vain, endeavored to suppress the emotion that betrayed itself in the violent workings of his countenance. It was the wrenching of a strong affection from a soul that was else all chaos and darkness. It was the obliteration of a guiding star that had led him to the topmost pinnacle of greatness, and without whose steady radiance he must blindly overstep his narrow foothold and plunge from the dizzy height. A solemn stillness rested upon the assemblage when the reading of the act ceased. Even the Bonaparte family were touched with Josephine's uncomplaining sorrow. She pressed her handkerchief to her eyes for an instant, then rising, took the oath of acceptance in a tremulous voice resumed her seat, and taking the pen, signed the document. The dreaded ceremony finished, she immediately retired, accompanied by Hortense and Eugene, who fell senseless as he reached the antechamber. The silent witnessing of his mother's suffering was too much for him to endure. For her sake, and in compliance with her entreaties, he had restrained his burning resentment. 
Josephine burst into an uncontrollable paroxysm of tears when she reached her private apartments, sobbing and groaning with an anguish heart-rending to behold. Carriages were in waiting to convey her to Malmaison. While preparations were making for her departure, Napoleon came to bid her a final farewell. As he approached, she threw herself in his arms, and clinging to him with a tenderness that conveyed more than words, the intensity and faithfulness of a love which nothing could tear from her heart. Overcome by her emotions, she fainted and was placed upon a couch, over which Napoleon hung with unconcealed anxiety and pain, tenderly stroking her cold face and himself applying restoratives. Returning consciousness brought her more frantic grief when she perceived the emperor was no longer near her, for he had hastily left the apartment, fearing another scene. She seized the hand of an officer who still remained, and in accents of wild sorrow entreated him to tell the emperor not to forget her. No one could restrain tears of sympathy for the beloved empress, so unjustly thrust from the affections of an adored husband. She was accompanied to Malmaison by persons of distinction, who continued to pay court to her, knowing they thus best secured the royal favor, though many followed her from pure love and sympathy. She still retained the title of empress, and received an ample revenue to support the expenses and incident to her rank. Malmaison was elegantly furnished and embellished with many costly articles sent her by Napoleon's orders. She here held her court, which was frequented by the savants of Paris, as well as the gay and beautiful. Thus Malmaison once more became the scene of fêtes, balls, and splendid entertainments. These gaieties could not divert Josephine from her one greatest sorrow. Every object in that lovely retreat, where their earliest days of happiness had been spent, reminded her of what she had in vain tried to forget. Her tears flowed afresh at the sight of the haunts they had frequented together, the flowers that had given her so much delight now only recalled painful associations. The rooms which had been exclusively Napoleon's she would permit no one but herself to enter, retaining every article precisely as he had left it. The maps he had studied, the books with leaves turned down, his apparel just where he had flung it in some impatient mood, everything remained undisturbed and sacred to her own eyes, already inflamed and almost sightless with continual weeping. What agonizing remembrances of happiness she must have endured in this silent, deserted apartment! What abandonment to grief where every object recalled the loved face and voice of one lost to her forever, and where no curious eyes checked her tears! It was well for her health and repose that she finally determined to forsake Malmaison and retire to the Chateau of Navarre, a palace that had lain nearly in ruins since the devastation of the Revolution, but which was charmingly situated in the midst of the forest of Evreux. It had originally been celebrated for its spacious park, elegant gardens, lakes, fountains, and all that could render it an envied possession. The occupation of restoring its original beauty, of giving employment to the poor peasantry in the neighborhood, as well as escaping the heartless attentions of courtiers and the wearisome gaieties of court, was a beneficial, wise change. Josephine was accompanied thither by her most intimate, valuable friends, and a few young ladies whose guardian she became. She was never forsaken, however, by the world, who testified the sincerity of its admiration by visits to this out-of-the-way home of the loved empress. Her mornings were passed in company with the ladies of her suite, engaged in some useful work, and listening at the same time to one who read aloud. The afternoons were occupied in rides, walks, or visits to the poor, who were constant objects of charity. The evenings were passed in the saloons in lively conversation, occasional games at cards, or listening to the music of the harp and piano in adjoining apartments, where the young people engaged in dances or noisy games, which however they much disturbed the quiet of the saloons, Josephine would never allow to be checked, for she loved to see all around her cheerful and happy, even while her own heart was too sad for her face to brighten with a single smile. The news of the Emperor's marriage with the beautiful Maria Louise of Austria was a new pang to her already lacerated feelings. She could not conceal her grief on her first meeting with Napoleon after the event that deprived her of every claim upon his thoughts and affections. He often visited her and evinced the lingering love and veneration he had entertained for her admirable character by the entire confidence with which he unfolded all his plans to her. A correspondence sustained between them was her greatest pleasure. 
The birth of a son at St. Cloud was announced to Josephine while attending a dinner given by the prefect at the city of Evreux. With no feeling of jealousy or envy, this noble woman added her congratulations and sincerely rejoiced with all of France at the accession of an heir to the throne. The only regret she expressed was that she had not first received the intelligence from Napoleon himself. When at length a letter arrived, communicating the tidings, she retired to read it and remained in seclusion an hour. When she returned to her guest, her face bore evident traces of tears. She longed to behold the young prince, a wish which Napoleon granted by himself placing the child in her arms, but which would have been refused by Maria Louise who so disliked Josephine that she would ride miles out of her way rather than pass the resident of her rival in the emperor's affections. Bonaparte continued to confide his most secret plans to Josephine. When he imparted to her his designs upon Russia, she used her utmost persuasion to induce him to abandon the wild project, in which she dimly foresaw his ruin. During that frightful campaign their correspondence was continued without interruption. His letters to her were more frequent and more affectionate than ever while hers, written by every opportunity, were perused under all circumstances with a promptitude which clearly showed the pleasure or consolation that was expected. In fact, it was observed that letters from Malmaison or Navarre were always torn rather than broken open, and were instantly read whatever else might be retarded. The news of his disasters filled Josephine with fearful apprehensions, more especially as the French had lost the blind enthusiasm with which they formerly worshipped their hero and were as ready to heap anathemas upon his name as they had before been eager to find superlatives with which to praise him. He returned to France with the shattered remains of his brilliant army, unwilling to believe her people would dare to conspire against the bold conqueror who challenged all the world to battle. Neither his self-confidence nor his giant grasp could retain the crown, lost in his vain reachings for another. It was too late now to retrace his steps. In a short and painful interview with Josephine, he acknowledged that he might still have been Emperor of France, had he regarded her faithful entreaties. This was the last time she ever beheld him. The revolution that soon succeeded alarmed her for his fate. Could she have flown to him when deserted by Maria Louise? Her grief would have been assuaged in imparting hope and consolation in his reverses, but she was obliged to wait in patient retirement widely separated from him the issue of events that threatened his freedom, if not his life. Her own future was a secondary matter. She scarcely knew what to expect from the Allied sovereigns. They will respect her, who was the wife of Napoleon, said she, and with truth, though the honor and deference paid her was not because of her rank, nor because her fame had been closely associated with the fearful, hated, yet strangely glorious name of Napoleon Bonaparte. It was due alone to the world-wide admiration of her noble, generous, exalted character. A message from the Allied sovereigns expressed a desire to visit her at Malmaison, with which she immediately complied for the sake of her children, whose honors and titles had vanished with the Emperor's downfall. On arriving at her beloved home she was deeply affected to find a guard of honor had been stationed there to protect her property from the pillage and destruction involved in a revolution, like the devastation that marks the track of a whirlwind. Josephine was here visited by the Emperor Alexander, with whom she pled for Napoleon. It was greatly owing to her influence and eloquence, and a regard for her devoted attachment for Napoleon, that severe measures were not taken to crush or effectually pinion his ambitious spirit. Josephine was comparatively happy when it was at last announced to her that he was to possess in full sovereignty the principality of the island of Elba, an envied fate in contrast to the one she had feared. Upon his departure with the few who were still devoted to him, she wrote a most affectionate and touching letter and would have followed him but for the delicacy of supplanting his rightful wife. Malmaison was again thronged with the great and gay, who came now not with empty flattery but to assure the empress of the most profound esteem. The emperor Alexander, on meeting her, expressed his gratification thus, Madam, I burned with the desire to behold you. Since I entered France I have never heard your name pronounced but with benedictions. In the cottage and in the palace I have collected accounts of your goodness and I do myself a pleasure in thus presenting to your majesty the universal homage of which I am the bearer. She was also visited by the King of Prussia. Louis, the occupant of the throne of France, conferred flattering distinctions upon Eugene, and would have made him Marshal of France, had his pride permitted him to accept the honor. Hortense was also received with marked favor. These monarchs, 
besides the most distinguished persons in Europe, frequently visited and dined at Malmaison, where Josephine gracefully did the honors. On the last occasion, May 19th, when a grand dinner was given to the Allied sovereigns, she became too ill to remain with her guests. She left her duties with Hortense to perform, obliged at length to yield to a disease that for some time she had endeavored to keep at bay. A malignant form of quinsy had fastened upon her, and despite the exertion of the most skillful physicians it made rapid and alarming progress. She articulated with much difficulty. She expressed affection for her children, who remained constantly at her bedside, by grateful and tender looks, often smiling upon them while enduring the severest pain, endeavoring to calm their agitation and lessen their anxiety. A few days, however, so changed the beloved countenance of their mother that no hopes were entertained for her recovery. She herself quickly recognized the hand of death. In her last moments her thoughts wandered far away to Elba, longing for the presence of one whom even the near approach of eternity could drive from her heart. A portrait of Napoleon hung near, which she motioned to be brought to her in place where she could gaze upon it, as if to number him who had forsaken her among the weeping ones gathered about her. Hortense and Eugene knelt at the bedside, overcome with grief, and sobbing painfully while they received her last blessing. At this moment the Emperor Alexander, who visited her daily, entered and was gratefully recognized by Josephine. She summoned all her remaining strength to say in a faint whisper, I shall die regretted. I have always desired the happiness of France. I did all in my power to contribute to it. I can say with truth that the first wife of Napoleon never caused a tear to flow. She died May 29, 1814, mourned, as she had said, not only by the French nation, but by all Europe. Princes testified their remembrance of her noble and eminent goodness by following her remains to the simple little church at Rouel, which was covered with black drapery on the occasion of her funeral. No ornament or inscription decorated the walls, but the tears of the proudest sovereigns of Europe mingled with those of the poor of France, to pronounce the funeral oration of the good Josephine. Her remains were afterwards placed in a beautiful tomb of white marble, upon which the Empress is represented in a kneeling posture, as if praying for France. It gives no recital of her virtues, no enumeration of titles. The monument only bears the simple, touching inscription, Eugene and Hortense, to Josephine. Though crowned an empress, she never lost the sweetness and simplicity of character that belonged to her lively girlhood in the quiet at Martinique. Early disappointments and afflictions, so far from embittering her nature, served to chasten and fortify her spirit for the gentle endurance of sterner griefs. Great in prosperity, she was greater in adversity. She is an example of humane sympathy, of calm reason, of lofty magnanimity, thorough integrity and unfaltering devotion to the objects of her affection. She was one of the countless instances of womanly tenderness repeatedly sacrificed to worldly schemes of the base and crafty, and she is an illustrious evidence of the higher policy of a frank and straightforward rectitude. Hers was that simple wisdom of a true heart which transcends the most dazzling genius of man, and as one of earth's true souls she will enlist the warm admiration of all who have an earnestness akin to hers so long as the world endures. End of section 21.